and welcome to This Week Explained, the geopolitical podcast that delves deep into the world's most pressing issues. Thank you so much for joining us as we bring you all the weekly insights and analysis on events and trends that are shaping our global landscape. As always, I'm Tiana, and I'm here with my co-host, Kervin, and together we aim to offer you a comprehensive understanding of the complexities of our dynamic and ever-changing world. So, without further ado, Kervin, let's dive into what's on your radar this week. All right, we're going to do Russia-Ukraine. Um, there's also speculation that Belarus has removed Wagner forces from the country. Uh, and since we're going to talk about Wagner forces, I want to give an update on the coup in, Ni- in Niger, as well as an update on what the Wagner forces are doing in Africa. And then we can talk about uh, quite an interesting development, and that's Russia's relationship with China right now. Which Deteriorating is- relationship? Could could be possibly um, possibly. possibly. Uh, we'll get into that, um, and then sticking with with China, we'll talk uh, U.S. So the U.S. signed a trade deal with Taiwan, and we'll go into how that affects the geopolitical situation in the Indo Pacific. And then, not to be outdone, uh, Kim Jong Un has told North Korea to prepare for war. <laughs> My bulky blender was such a pain to use, I ended up hardly ever using it at all. But the Blendjet 2 Portable Blender makes blending so easy and convenient, I use it just about every day. Blendjet 2 is portable, so you can blend up a smoothie at work, a protein shake at the gym, or even a margarita on the beach. It's small enough to fit in a cup holder, but powerful enough to blast through tough ingredients like ice and frozen fruit with ease. Blendjet 2 is whisper quiet, so you can make your morning smoothie without waking up the whole house. It lasts for 15 plus blends and recharges quickly via a USB-C cord. Best of all, Blendjet 2 cleans itself. Just blend water with a drop of soap and you're good to go. With over 30 plus colors and patterns to choose from, there's a Blendjet 2 to complement just about any style. I absolutely love the Lisa Frank edition. What are you waiting for? Go to Blendjet.com and grab yours today. And be sure to use the promo code ANALYTICS12 to get 12% off your order and free two-day shipping. No other portable blender on the market comes close to the quality, power, and innovation of Blendjet 2. They guarantee you'll love it or your money back. Blend anytime, anywhere with the Blendjet 2 Portable Blender. Go to Blendjet.com and use the code ANALYTICS12 to get 12% off your order and free two-day shipping. Shop today and get the best deal ever. Well, let's get started. What is the latest in Ukraine? Yeah, this week there was some speculation that Ukrainian forces conducted what was titled a limited raid across the Dnipro River, uh, and then they landed on the east bank uh, of the Dnipro River in Kherson Oblast. Now, there are reports that Ukrainian forces landed up to seven boats, and each of those boats had around six to seven military personnel. And they managed to break through Russian defensive lines and advance up to 800 meters into the area. What is the significance of this event? Well, it appears that Ukraine has actually improved their tactics in crossing the Dnipro. Because they tried a similar tactic with, uh, or they they tried to cross the Dnipro with uh, special operations forces a month ago. And received heavy opposition from Russian artillery, artillery and small arms. Now, a full-scale breakthrough across this river would actually be a significant strategic victory for Ukraine. So that's going to open up the possibility of a major offensive against Russian forces in Kherson, but also in Crimea. We've talked about before that Ukraine's been very vocal about its desire to kind of flip the script in this conflict and make an attempt at regaining Crimea. So it, it looks like they may be planning to do that. Now, the river crossing would be very difficult, um, but even though it's very difficult, it would be a huge win for the Ukrainians. And that's because it's going to force, it would force Russia to redeploy troops from other parts of the country. And it would also be a major morale boost for the Ukrainian people. So those two things. And then finally, it would actually continue to show that Russia has major military issues in this conflict. They're not the major military that we all thought that they were. 
So um, from the, the start of the conflict, the Dnipro River was seen as Russia's best avenue into Kiev, so blocking off Russia's access to it, especially on the heels of recent reports of a planned assassination of President Zelensky. That's going to be a major defeat for Russia. Um, but a miscalculation by Ukraine could lead to an avenue of approach for Russian forces into Kiev. Can we kind of get into that planned assassination of Zelensky? I mean, this certainly comes as no surprise to you. We've discussed Russia's plan to take out Zelensky and install a pro-Russian leader. So was this part of the plan from the start and um, Ukraine finally found out it was involved or is this a new threat? So there's no confirmation that this recent assassination plot was part of pre-existing long-term plans by Russia. And that would be to remove him and install the pro-Russian leader, like you said. Uh, he's faced multiple assassination attempts since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022. So the specific details suggest this was a recent event and Ukraine's security forces became aware of the plan and then they took swift action to thwart it. And do you think this will continue until the end of the conflict, no matter how many times this plot is thwarted? Yeah, uh, I mean, it goes back to what you said when you set up the question. Uh, it's been happening since the start of the Russian invasion. It's always been the plan. The easiest way to, to take Kiev, yeah, is, is um, take out Zelensky. If you take Kiev, you can take Ukraine. And you, you got to eliminate Zelensky to do that and then install a pro-Russian leader. Is Zelensky being more cautious in protecting himself after this latest foiled attempt? If it was me, I mean, I would. But he says that he is just leaving it to the professionals in his security forces and that doing that has given him peace of mind that they've been proactive in stopping these attempts so far. OK, let's get into the latest news about the Wagner forces in Belarus. What is the update since that agreement was made between Prigozhin and Putin a couple months ago? Yeah, it's an interesting development. Um, there is some speculation the deal between Prigozhin and Putin that Lukashenko allegedly facilitated has begun to collapse. So, yeah, well, I mean, who didn't see that coming, right? Yeah. All these people vying for power. You mean they one of them wants power more than the other one? And they'll fight for it? All, that's, what, that's what I mean. I mean, I meant like they're, they're all fighting for the same thing here. Yeah, and, and it's going to take... to be second fiddle. They all want to be the number one dude. Right. You are exactly right. Things. Parting things. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. It's, it's three people who have power who want absolute power. Right. And so now they're fighting against each other from, you know, what we have seen in, like, social media posts and things like that. This is coming from an insider source. Uh, within Belarus that suggests that Wagner forces are currently undergoing the initial stage of withdrawal from Belarus with groups of personnel being transported to various regions in Russia. Uh, this movement is said to be a response to Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko's alleged refusal to finance the Wagner forces. And this was after he found out that Russia wasn't going to be providing any funding as he had thought they would. So he, so Putin was basically shoving the Wagner forces off yeah. to Lukashenko. Right. Like the, yeah. No upside for Lukashenko. They just take a problem off Putin's plate. Which I, that's been this. going on from the beginning, right? It's like, hey, hold yeah. these nuclear weapons. Hey, do this. And there's no upside other than like a supposed promise of like being second command. Right. But you're really or... Putin's pawn. Yeah. Well... Got to figure it out at some point, I guess. <laughs> this is not a good week for Russia and Belarus. But you said this is from an insider source. So is there tangible evidence of this happening? Or is it one of those single source reports that you dislike so much? Well, I mean, I've seen it across several outlets. But I right now I can't confirm if they're using a couple of different sources. Are they all most media will all feed from the exact same source? and then push it out and make it look like it's different sources. I can't I can't get to the bottom of that just yet. But you know, I'll tell you, it, once I do, um, 
Well, what we do know from visible evidence is that there's been no movement of Wagner forces out of Belarus. And there's even uh, Wagner affiliated sources that have mentioned the quote unquote activation of Wagner forces at the end of August, but they haven't elaborated on the details just yet. Well, we'll keep an eye out on this development and see what comes of the possible activation of Wagner forces, if that happens at the end of this month. Let's move over to Africa, where I'm sure we will talk more about Wagner forces. Yeah. We're not done with you yet. And get an update on the Niger coup. What is happening in that country and honestly, all across Western Africa? What's going on? Yeah, it's still a very difficult situation in Niger. Uh, the U.S. has gotten involved diplomatically with acting Deputy Secretary of State Victoria Nuland attempting to meet with uh, Niger President Mohamed Bazoum. And she also wanted to meet with this new self proclaimed leader, uh, General Abdurrahman Ch- Chiani. I tried to do that as good as I could. Hey. <laughs> I Sorry. Saw you pulling from uh, from your linguistics. Yep. <laughs> Deep down inside. <laughs> yeah. You tried. It fix- was a valid effort. You tried. Thank you. I hope everybody appreciates that. But obviously, if it's wrong, you can also correct us. <laughs> Please. Please do. Uh, Newland and U.S. diplomatic and military officials met. Um, th- so they weren't allowed to meet with either one of those um and so they the, met, the officials were the nigerian officials blocked that yeah. you said both meetings yes yeah yeah, yeah sorry they couldn't meet they were unsuccessful so we were so we weren't invited we just showed up and was like yes can we have a meeting with the president and the new president please in so, true american fashion in true american fashion just showed up <laughs> demanded an audience with the two Conflicting leaders. <laughs> right, during a very serious point in very in that country. Serious tense, yeah. Yeah. So they were allowed to then instead meet with the junta's chief of defense, who has a strong history of collaboration with U.S. military forces, because uh, there's that counterterrorism uh, campaign that we did in Niger. Now, the conversation however, was described as, quote, difficult. Um, And the chief of defense conveyed that the junta believed their takeover was justified and that Bazoum was no longer the legitimate leader. They also, unfortunately, would not assure the president's safety if foreign military intervened or if an intervention occurred. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so we know which side they're on. Yeah, definitely. So have the Wagner forces gotten involved at all? And um, if they did, what is their current status across the continent of Africa? So they haven't gotten involved directly, but there is some speculation that they want to use this event to increase their stronghold in Africa Um, because the coup already has sparked anti-France and pro-Russian sentiment in Niger, similar to what we observed in Mali and Burkina Faso after their own coups. Now, many Western nations are cautioning the governments of all these countries to not allow Wagner forces to increase their role on the continent, as what they say is there has been a trail of death, destruction, and exploitation wherever those voice, those forces have operated. So what does the future look like for Niger after nearly two weeks under this coup? So the path forward for Niger depends on a combination of domestic and international factors. Uh, the country's leader, uh, leaders, civil society, uh, regional partners, and the international community, they're going to play a crucial role in determining the country's future trajectory. Uh, Niger is currently being isolated internationally as diplomatic efforts are underway, but if it can't be resolved through words... Uh, that military intervention we spoke about before is very possible. And then at that moment, we could see a major conflict in the region. And that conflict will cross multiple borders. Well, that's certainly not good for the people of Niger or countries like Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mali, as they deal with violent extremism from terrorists. And now this. So ah, let's move 
to the Indo-Pacific for now. We'll table this discussion about Africa. We'll obviously keep you updated. So let's move to the Indo-Pacific and talk China's relationship with Russia, which may be fracturing. <laughs> Do you have any information on where that relationship stands currently? Right. So China and Russia's longstanding no limits friendship <laughs> is and then this is I mean, this is just how we see it on a geopolitical level. Um, Russia invaded Ukraine and, and China was like, yeah, whatever. So it used it was this longstanding no limits friendship, but it does appear to be facing some challenges as the conflict in Ukraine continues. I don't think Xi understood it was going to take this long. Um, but this current uh, fracture that we're seeing stems from the recent peace talks in Saudi Arabia where Russia was notably absent, but Chinese officials attended. And um, this signaled a possible win for Ukraine and definitely a setback for Russia. Well, has China made any statements about their involvement in the peace talks? So, yeah, so China's top diplomat, Wang Yi, reassured his Russian counterpart of their strong friendship and partnership, despite their involvement in peace talks. Um, China's other recent actions... So they've refused to approve a Siberian gas pipeline, and they have not provided full military support to Russia. Are leaving That's leaving some hope in Western nations that China's sh sort of shifting their alliance with Russia. So that's, that's on those Western nations. That's their hope. My analysis, however, is that despite these tensions, China and Russia share mutual interests. Both leaders, so it's uh, Xi and Vladimir Putin, they aim, their aim is to reduce U.S. influence on the global stage, and they also seek to challenge the existing international order. Those shared goals continue to make them natural allies. So while China and Russia's alliance faces some challenges and nuanced dynamics, their shared goals and interests continue to make them strategic partners. But... We've spoken about this before, you know, belt, the Belt and Road Initiative, the possible BRICS currency. Russia, if they're smart, they should not overly rely on China. China's historical approach involves playing both sides to its benefit. So as Russia becomes more dependent on China, there's a potential risk of China taking actions that suit its own interests down the line. Since we're talking about China's interests, let's get into this trade deal between the U.S. and Taiwan, because this was not in their best interest. Great. <laughs> so what do you know about the deal? And then can we get into the implications, since Taiwan is not publicly viewed as its own country, according to U.S. foreign policy? We also yeah. like to play both sides of the fence. <laughs> yeah. yeah, much like much like everybody. And, and I promise yeah, at this point... Know. I'm going to slow down a little bit. As we mentioned on the Instagram post, we had some travel that, that happened, and I'm a little wired right now, I guess, so I can sense myself rushing all of my answers to you. I don't think you're rushing. Oh, good. But I felt that way. Okay, well, if you still feel like you need to slow down, slow down. This is the point where we'll take a pause. And Let's breathe in. So do a little meditation, well, a little breathing meditation, technique, you guys. Yeah, that's my addition to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. gonna breathing technique, guided meditation. All right. Um, but I I also want to slow down a little bit because this is a very uh, it's it's a very tense moment, and I think it's a very important uh, topic to discuss. Um, so we'll talk. So the agreement is what's called the U.S. Taiwan Initiative on 21st Century Trade First Agreement Implementation Act. That is a stupid name. Yeah. I think they come up with something more slick than that. That's just a bunch of words. Gone are the times or, of things like name? the New Deal. Or the U.S. T.I. 21 C.T.F.A.I.A. That's it. Everyone got that? Everyone y'all got that? <laughs> Hashtag. I don't, I, don't even, I don't even remember what I just said, so. Uh, that that initiative, <laughs> USTI-21CTFAIA, was <laughs> officially signed this week by President Joe Biden. Um, the agreement 
was signed after a year of negotiations, and it focuses on customs and border procedures, regulatory practices, and anti-corruption measures. Now, the signing of a trade agreement between the U.S. and Taiwan could be seen by China as a breach of its One China policy, and that would lead to extreme diplomatic tensions. The U.S.-China relationship is, as we have talked about every week since we started this, is strained due to various issues such as trade disputes, uh, the U.S. has human rights concerns against China, and then there's the geopolitical rivalry. Any move that directly involves Taiwan is going to exacerbate those tensions. It's going to prompt a strong reaction from China. Seems like this recent development could keep Xi's 2025 plan to, quote, reunify Taiwan on track. See, yeah, Staying in the end of the Pacific, we should definitely talk about the recent reports that Kim Jong-un is preparing North Korea for war. Are these just words, or is there evidence that Kim is serious about engaging in a war with South Korea very soon? So as with anything concerning Kim Jong-un, and North Korea for that matter, Anything and everything I say will be just speculation because he is the wild card in geopolitics. We just don't really know what he's going to do. What we what we do know is that Kim Jong-un has removed his top general, and then he instructed uh, escalated war preparations to which he said in an offensive way as opposed to like a national defense strategy. That offensive way includes production of weapons and increased military drills. Well, can you kind of give your own analysis on how war between North and South Korea could play out? Yeah, sure. So first, I will say that uh, technically the two countries are still at war. Uh, that's It's termed a frozen war. And this is because no peace agreement was signed after the Korean War. There was just an armistice agreement. That means they just uh, agreed to stop fighting, but true peace has not been arranged. That's why you have the demilitarized zone in between the two Koreas. And so moving on from that technicality, I could see the following happen, uh, especially with North Korea performing increasingly provocative actions. So here goes. Uh, North Korea launches a missile attack on South Korea. South Korea responds with its own missile attack, and the two countries engage in a limited war. At that point, the United States intervenes on the side of South Korea, obviously, and then the conflict escalates into full, full-scale war. So let's, let's say that never happens. Uh, neither country launches a missile attack. Um, another scenario I could see is the death of Kim Jong-un. And like I said, I've said this before, that's not it's not happening right now. I don't see it happening anytime soon. But if it does happen, that could lead to a power struggle in North Korea, which could destabilize the country. Um, if his sister were to take over, and I do think she would, there's a possibility she then launches an attack on South Korea to show how strong she is as a leader. And that would then go back to that full-scale war we just discussed. Well, understanding that no one wins in any war, do you have an idea of which country comes out victorious in these scenarios? Yeah, you make you make a great point. Nobody, nobody wins, right? We definitely would much rather see a peace deal between all countries involved and improve diplomatic relations. But understanding that that may not be possible, we have to look at several factors to predict which country achieves a military victory. Now, North Korea has a larger military than South Korea, but it's not as well equipped or trained. South Korea has the backing of the United States, which would likely provide significant military support in the event of a conflict. The game changer is that North Korea has developed nuclear weapons. They've done that to deter or even defeat an attack from South Korea or the United States. In the end, what's likely going to happen is that a conflict between the two countries would be long and bloody with no clear winner. So it's my assessment that there's a high probability another armistice would be signed after a long and bloody war. And that's only if the conflict 
uh, doesn't also lead to a wider war involving the U.S., China, and Russia. Then we have a global conflict, and that scenario is much tougher to analyze at this time. So an attack from North Korea could give Xi the opportunity he needs to then invade Taiwan while everybody's distracted by war on the Korean Peninsula, plus the ongoing conflict in Russia. And if it does play out like that, it could be that this was Xi's plan all along. So a few weeks ago, delegates from Russia and China actually arrived in North Korea in what was the first high-level visit by any foreign official to North Korea since the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Is that when those pictures came out with Kim Jong-un walking down a hall with huge portraits of Putin on the hall? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah that's a... Like massive pictures pretending like he didn't just remove his dad's face from the wall and put Putin in there. <laughs> so and he's was discussed. Oh, okay. Well, I, I want to get back to we we can start we can keep discussing that and why why Kim Jong Un would do that. Um, he he needs the support. He's buttering Putin up. That's what yep. he's doing. <laughs> That's what happens when when you come back home and there's big pictures of you everywhere. Um, you're like, what's going on, Kervin? What what did you do? Oh Lord, you don't do that. <laughs> well, then you go to the kitchen and it's a mess. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's that, it. Yeah. yeah, that actually tracks. That makes sense. Yes. <laughs> so, what was discussed? Come on, dude, let's get to it. All right. So that meeting involved talks to strengthen the military ties between those three countries, because um, they're all nuclear powers, and those three nuclear powers are looking to diminish the United States' role in global affairs. And I will say they're doing a pretty good job of it in various countries. Um, I haven't seen an official statement released on the meetings, but I am sure there was discussion on the U.S. decision to place nuclear submarines at a South Korean port. Um, those countries want to deter those types of alliances between the U.S. and Indo-Pacific countries. So we continue to live in a world in flux. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kervin, for your analysis. Is that all you have for us this week? Uh, that's all for me, unless you had anything that you wanted to add. Nope. Just wanted to thank, <laughs> I just want to thank you guys for listening to our humble little geopolitical podcast. We hope you found it both informative and engaging. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, please let us know. And if you would like in-depth coverage of these stories and more, follow us on Instagram at Oakland Analytics. Tiana, thank you so much. And until next week, Stay safe out there.